I'm Jim Kircher and this year is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment taking effect. 1920 was the first election year when women all across the country could legally vote. But our story takes place in the presidential election year of 1872. That October, a St. Louis woman showed up and tried to register to vote. She got turned away, but the way she saw it, she had as much right to vote as the next guy. Virginia Minor didn't live nearly long enough to see the passage of the 19th Amendment. She was part of the women's suffrage movement that was gaining momentum after the Civil War and taking action. So in 1872, uh, Virginia Minor, a St. Louis woman, attempts to register to vote. She Elizabeth visits, Eichmann is working on her PhD in American Studies at St. Louis office, University. Goes in, meets the registrar, Reese Happerset, and attempts to register to vote for the presidential election happening just a month later. She meets Reese Happerset and he denies um, her attempt to register to vote on the basis that she isn't male. She knows this is going to happen, I'm guessing. Yes. Missouri's constitution at the time limited voting to men only. Virginia Minor had not broken any law by trying to register, but she argued that based on the U.S. Constitution, it was the registrar who broke the law by turning her away and took that argument to the courthouse downtown. Was it meant to be a test case? Was that what they were um, attempting to do there? Yeah, I think so. They were ready, they had a plan, and they were gonna see how far they could take it. Oh, I think that um, there, there hadn't been a case like this before, uh, certainly not with the argument that they brought forth. The they she's talking about is Virginia Minor and her husband, Francis Minor. They moved to St. Louis before the Civil War, bought a farm east of King's Highway, right here, and he was an attorney and hardly a bystander in all of this. In fact, Virginia Minor literally could not have made her case without him. Per Missouri law, Virginia wouldn't have been able to bring this suit forth by herself. It was illegal for married women uh, to sue. So he, if you look at old court documents, you'll see it's his name and her name in everything. So it was a joint suit, very much a joint effort. And he was one of the three attorneys that also represented the case. While she was the one who tried to register to vote, Francis Minor had prepared the legal argument. And after losing in circuit court and then the Missouri Supreme Court, he ended up arguing the case in the highest court in the country. She was the first to argue on the basis of the 14th Amendment that actually, as they argued, women already had the right to vote. The recently passed 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution was designed to give African Americans and former slaves the full rights of U.S. citizenship. And the miners zeroed in on this sentence, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. They argued that voting was one of those privileges, and since Mrs. Minor was a citizen, she had the privilege of voting, even if Missouri's Constitution said otherwise. The Supreme Court unanimously disagreed. Chief Justice Morrison Waite read the ruling that voting had never been one of the privileges of citizenship, that the Constitution does not confer the right of suffrage on anybody. That, the court said, is up to the states, and Missouri is free to limit that right to men only. This was news because Virginia Minor's action, the legal challenge in 1872, was much more than a local story, and it was meant to be. It was most definitely part of a larger movement. So in St. Louis specifically, there's evidence that a movement had been growing since at least the mid 1860s, but I suspect even likely before then. The women's suffrage movement in the US marks its beginning in the 1840s. It was to some extent put on hold during the Civil War, but many women came out of the war years more determined than ever to achieve that right to vote. Like other women, Virginia Minor had volunteered in Union Army hospitals in St. Louis. She worked with a group that helped refugees that had streamed in from southern battlefields. She and many other women during the Civil War had served their country. 
It kind of reminds me of, of the way women felt when they were working during World War II, the Rosie and Riveters, and to, to redefining their role in society. Yes, absolutely. Without a doubt, women saw a connection between their work during the Civil War and the work that they would eventually do in the suffrage movement. So they sort of became mobilized during this moment of the Civil War. It's ended and they're thinking, okay, what can we do next as citizens? How can we best uh, perform our citizenship? How can we best be an engaged, an engaged citizenry? And for them, that was to be involved in the political process and to vote. The ruling in Virginia Miners' case was important because it made clear to the suffrage movement that the constitutional argument would not work and suffragists focused efforts either on winning the vote state by state or promoting a constitutional amendment. They did win the vote in many states in the coming years and finally for the whole country when the 19th Amendment took effect 100 years ago. But even then, Minor versus Happersett still had relevance because states still did have powers over voting and they would use it. Their narrow defining of the 14th Amendment really changed how states approached suffrage and how they put limits on suffrage. So this is where we get um, a sort of precedent for literacy tests or poll taxes that come in the decades that follow that limit who has access to voting, whether or not they have some kind of right to it. After losing their case, Virginia and Francis Minor kept fighting the fight. His 1892 obituary said that together with his wife, Francis Minor was an efficient and untiring advocate of women's suffrage. Virginia Minor died two years later at the age of 72. The paper noted that there were no religious services and also reported that in her will, she would leave her two nieces $500 each as long as they didn't marry. So maybe she was hoping for a future in which women <laughs> would be able to make gains without having to be married and wanted to pass that on to her nieces. Um, she, she left on her terms as well. Yes, exactly, she left on her terms. Virginia Minor, who spent most of her life fighting for the right to vote, is not one of the big names associated with the American women's suffrage movement. At the end of her life, she had not achieved her goal, but in her will, she also left $1,000 to Susan B. Anthony to carry on the fight.